surely there cannot be a citizen of British Columbia who has not heard of the huge hydroelectric development of the Peace River, where one of the largest earth-filled dams in the world is creating a man-made lake 240 miles long in a cleft of the Rocky Mountain Trench. It may come as a surprise to many, though, that it's not the first time this area has been underwater. At one time, many millions of years ago, it was covered by a vast inland sea that stretched from the Arctic Ocean to the Gulf of California and divided the North American continent in two. At that time, dinosaurs walked the earth, ranging through the lush, swampy landscape. Their footprints made on the soft ground, which somehow held those impressions until it became rock, can still be seen, looking surprisingly recent. On the bed of the inland sea, scallop-like shellfish lay in their thousands, and they too have left their fossilized impressions for us to wonder at. Much later, some 58 million years ago, in a mighty upheaval, the Earth's crust wrinkled upward to create the Rocky Mountains. The only major break leading eastward in the long mountain range was at Finley Forks, where the Parsnip and the Finley Rivers come together to form the peace. It was apparently the trapped waters of that ancient inland sea seeking an outlet that kept this gap open. Moving ahead to one million years ago, a mere yesterday in the geological time scale, the last of three great ice ages crept over the land and this whole area was covered with glaciers. Ice accumulated to the north where the upper reaches of the Finley River now flow and to the south at the headwaters of the Parsnip. These two glaciers moved towards each other, met at Finley Forks and thrust eastward through the valley where the peace now flows. And so again, dammed by a huge plug of ice, the land was underwater. This was the time of the woolly mammoth and its remains in the form of great curved tusks were found when work on the dam uncovered them. Jumping now into our own time, early explorers first entered what was to become British Columbia by way of the Peace River. Fur traders and prospectors built cabins along its banks. But for years the area was considered beyond the economic reach of the logging industry and it was not until 1956 that the inventory division of the Forest Service made a preliminary survey to examine the forest potential of the district. Even then it was a roadless wilderness depending on the rivers for access. The few settlements were small and isolated with the McDougall's farm at Finley Forks being typical. In 1958 and again in 1961 Forest fires denuded a total of 30,000 acres, and it was decided that an access road was imperative if such conflagrations were to be contained. In 1961, the engineering division of the Forest Service began a road survey into the area, and this was continued in 1962 as far as Scott Creek. Road construction had started in April 1962 before any definite decision on the hydro development had been made. Then in 1963, the dam was given the green light and road construction went into high gear. The access road was upgraded to the status of a hauling road, which would enable the marketable timber in the area to be taken out before flooding began. At this time too, plans were made to investigate access to low bottom lands and to the various sites where clearing would take place. Maps of the country were accurate enough for ordinary purposes, but now a huge new lake was contemplated and it was of the utmost importance to have accurate measurements of elevations if the limits of flooding were to be correctly predicted. In November 1963, it was decided that aerial mapping would be the quickest and most accurate way of obtaining this information. The Air Division of the Surveys and Mapping Branch of the Department of Lands was called in, and their experience and know-how made surprisingly short work of a rather big job. Originally, it had been hoped that the whole of what would become the lake bottom could be cleared, but the estimated cost of doing this was in excess of $100 million, quite beyond the financial resources then available. The Honorable Ray Williston, Minister of Lands, Forests and Water Resources, felt strongly that no merchantable timber should be flooded and that floating debris must be kept to a minimum. It was realized, too, that in addition to providing water to drive the generators at the W.A.C. Bennett Dam, there would be extra dividends in the form of industrial sites, recreational areas, and navigation channels, all of which would open up vast new areas of the province for development.
prepare for these facilities was a big job, particularly when the time factor was considered. Consequently, it was planned that the work to be done first would meet immediate needs, but that the work would continue until a complete cleanup had been achieved and all usable wood salvaged. High water level for the lake had been set at an elevation of 2,200 feet above sea level, and ultimately the lake shore will be cleared of all timber to at least 80 feet below this mark. In January 1963, the Forest Service began work on the clearing plan, and from the very beginning, this clearing has been a joint effort by private enterprise and the British Columbia Forest Service. By June 1969, some 90 million cubic feet of salvage timber had been scaled, and salvage by industry will continue for some time to come. In the lower areas, all merchantable timber was removed, but the rest of the wood was ignored since it would have no effect on the later use of the lake. This clearing was a problem in logistics and precise timing, as all operations had to be coordinated with the expected rise of the water and with economic factors. Much of the logging was by conventional methods using chainsaws, skidders, and trucks. But for some of the timber, tree shears were used, snipping off mature trees at root level, like a child cutting flowers with scissors. In January 1964, the Forest Service established a semi-permanent camp at Finley Forks. And in the same year, two huge tree crushers were brought into operation. Like tremendous steamrollers with studded wheels, they moved across the countryside, mowing down the trees as easily as a reaper in a field of wheat. Another novel method of clearing used, the so-called cat and chain, consisted of a massive chain attached to two bulldozers, which pulled the chain through the timber and knocked over everything in its path. As the water level of the lake, now named Williston Lake, began to rise, certain problems arose. Native Indians had to be relocated. Their children and the children of other workers on the project needed schooling, and so a school was built. The shacks and cabins of some of the old timers would soon be underwater, but with their typical resourcefulness and spirit, they adapted quickly to the new conditions. Sawmills, once on the river bank, were now threatened, and they had to be transported to new sites. The Forest Service road was proving its worth, even though, like any other highway, it had its share of accidents. During all this, the clearing went on. Most of the non-usable timber was pushed by bulldozers into piles and burned. The experience of Forest Service personnel in slash burning proved invaluable, and limbs, tops, saplings, and other debris that might later float to the surface went up in smoke. From an economic standpoint, in some areas, it was better to wait for the water to rise and provide easy transport than to punch haul roads through the bush, roads that in any case were destined to be flooded. Consequently, some trees were felled and bucked, but left to float on the rising waters to be collected later. Now that the lake was growing, boats which had been built down on the coast were shipped north, assembled and launched. Behind tow boats, booms of salvaged logs began to appear, heading for the sawmills. Aircraft of many types and sizes played a big part in almost every phase of the operation, starting with the aerial survey of 1963, through the supplying of remote camps by helicopter, to the transportation of workers and engineers. The water level continued to rise. Along some of the riverbanks, it seeped under sandy bluffs which would crash down, sometimes sending miniature tidal waves crashing along the shores. Geography was being changed. This old bear, and probably his ancestors before him, had used this riverside trail for years. And he was absolutely baffled to find that it now led nowhere. Moose and other wildlife moved to higher ground as the flooding continued. 
If the area is to realize its full economic potential, industrial sites must be developed. And already the instant town of Mackenzie is taking shape. Thanks to the carefully planned clearing program, harbor sites and navigation channels await the influx of further industry. Speaking in general terms, it can be said that the Forest Service has achieved the goal set for it. What compromises there are have been dictated by economic necessity. Their job is not over. At the moment, floating logs and debris mar the lake surface. But as time and money permit, the remaining merchantable wood will be salvaged and the residual debris will be removed and disposed of. By the spring of 1969, the Gordon Shrum Generating Station had become the largest single source of electric power in the province. And the time is not far distant when Williston Lake, in addition to providing a source of electric power, will be a center of industrial activities, bringing further benefits to the whole of British Columbia.